Section 1.1, four ways to represent a function. Functions arise whenever one quantity depends on another. Consider the following four situations. Part A, the area A of a circle depends on the radius R of the circle. The rule that connects R and A is given by the equation A, which is equal to pi R squared. With each positive number R, there is associated one value of A, and we say that a is a function of r. Part b, the human population of the world, p, depends on the time t. So if you look at this table here, it gives estimates of the world population, p of t, at time t for certain years. So for instance, p of 1950, which represents the year, is the input, gives us an output of 2,560 million, which is the same thing as 2,560,000,000. Now, but for each value of time t, there is a corresponding value of p, and we say that p is a function of the time t. The cost c of mailing a large envelope depends on the weight w of the envelope. Although there is no simple formula that connects W and C, the post office has a rule for determining C when the weight is known. Part D, the vertical acceleration A of the ground as measured by a seismograph during an earthquake is a function of the elapsed time T. Figure one shows a graph generated by the seismic activity during the Northridge earthquake that shook Los Angeles in 1994. For a given value of t, the graph provides a corresponding value of a. So the value of t is in seconds. The vertical is centimeters per second squared. So the vertical ground acceleration during the Northridge earthquake. Now, each of these examples describes a rule, rule whereby, given a number, r, t, w, or t, another number, a, p, c, or a, is assigned. In each case, we say that the second number is a function of the first number. A function f is a rule that assigns to each element x in a set d exactly one element called f of x in a set e. We usually consider functions for which the sets D and E are sets of real numbers. The set D is called the domain of the function. The number f of x is the value of f at x and is read f of x. The range of f is the set of all possible values of f of x as x varies throughout the domain. A symbol that represents an arbitrary number in a domain of a function f is called an independent variable, and a symbol that represents a number in the range of f is called a dependent variable. In example a, for instance, r is the independent variable and a is the dependent variable. Now, it's helpful to think of a function as a machine. If we take a look at figure two, in figure two, we have x, that represents the input. The input goes into the function, and then what you get is f of x, which is the output. If x is in a domain of the function f, then when x enters the machine, it's accepted as an input, and the machine produces an output, f of x, according to the rule of the function. Thus, we can think of the domain as a set of all possible inputs, and the range as the set of all possible outputs. The pre-programmed functions in a calculator are good examples of a function as a machine. For example, the square root key on your calculator computes such a function. You press the key label, the square root sign, or the square root of x, and enter the input x. If x is less than zero, then x is not in a domain of this function. That is, x is not acceptable, acceptable input, and the calculator will indicate an error. If x is greater than or equal to zero, then an approximation to the square root of x will appear in the display. Thus, the square root of x key on your calculator is not quite the same as the exact mathematical function f defined by f of x, which is equal to the square root of x. So let's just quickly see this on the calculator. 
If I take the square root of a number that's less than zero, we're going to put in, let's say, negative one. We're going to get a non-real answer. That means it's not in the domain. Now, if we decide to take the square root of, let's say, three, then we're going to get an approximation. Now, another way to picture a function is by an arrow diagram, as you can see here in figure three. Each arrow connects an element of D in this whole set of D to an element of E. And the arrow indicates the function f of x is associated with x. f of a is associated with a, and so on. So we can see here that f of x is associated with x, f of a is associated with a, and so on. Now the most common method for visualizing a function is its graph. If f is a function with domain d, then its graph is a set of ordered pairs, where x and f of x such that x is in a set of d. Notice that these are input-output pairs. So in other words, the graph of f consists of all points x, y in the coordinate plane such that y is equal to f of x and x is in the domain of f. Now, the graph of a function f gives us a useful picture of the behavior or life history of a function. Since the y coordinate of any point x, y on the graph is y is equal to f of x, we can read the value of f of x from the graph as being the height of the graph above the point x. If we look at figure four, we can see that here, zero, one, two, and x. So the height up here of the function represents the height at zero. One is the input, and then the height represents f of one. This is the input, and then the height represents f of two. Here's the input x, and the height is f of x. Now, the graph of f also allows us to picture the domain of f on the x-axis and its range on the y-axis, as in figure 5. So here, if we take a look at this graph, it starts on the left here, and then it goes up, and then it ends over here. So now, the red line here represents the domain of the function. So we can see here that from here to here represents the domain. And then the range represents the height of the function. So it goes from here to here, so therefore that represents the range.